All right, I am back, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome Camille Fournier, who will be giving our first keynote speak of speech of the day. And uh, I won't steal any more of her time. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me and see me OK, see my slides. Uh, this is my first time presenting to such a large group remotely, uh, and it's kind of a wild experience. I'm used to getting on stages, which is always, you know, in front of big audiences, which is always scary. This is somehow scarier because I can't see any of you and I have no idea if you're like rolling your eyes at me, chucking tomatoes. So anyway, uh, I, I hope this all goes okay. I'm here in uh, New York City in my bedroom, uh, office, gym, life room uh, these days during this fun pandemic period. Time. Uh, but I'm really thrilled to be here, uh, able to talk to you all uh, at ApacheCon. Uh, this talk is about building engaged communities. So, uh, you know, to begin, I like to start out by, by using this quote, right? In a time of drastic change is the learners who inherit the future. Um, and look, the point of this quote, I think it's pretty obvious to uh, tech people, right? If you want to be able to, you know, stay relevant as things change all around you, you've got to keep learning, right? You can't stay stuck in your old ways. I think that's that's pretty well understood by engineers. Um, but I think it's worth spending a minute just really emphasizing how much change there is and continues to be in the open source community alone. So uh, back in 2008, some of you might have been doing open source around then, I was a little bit. Um, the biggest kind of active repository for open source projects outside of the big foundations was SourceForge. So maybe that's a blast from the past for some of you. Um, and there were 18,000 active open source projects in SourceForge back then, I think. I forget how I found this information, but let's assume it's relatively true. So uh, when I was working on this talk, I looked up how many public repositories there were in GitHub today, and there are 41 million. Now, okay, fine, that's just public repositories. If you look at public repositories with at least five forks, so presumably if it's got five forks, probably some people are working on it together. Now you get to around 1 million. And again, that's not all necessarily open source software, but it is pretty astounding how much change has happened to open source and how just how much massive adoption we've seen uh, in open source in the past 10, 10 plus years. Um, it, it really kind of blows my mind uh, how how different things have become there. Um, so before I you know before I get into what I'm going to talk about here, I guess I'll introduce myself. Um, so as I said, my name is Camille. Um, I'm currently the head of platform engineering at a company called Two Sigma, which is a financial company here in New York City. Um, prior to Two Sigma, I worked, I was the CTO of a startup called Rent the Runway, which many of you may or may not have heard of. Uh, it is rents uh, designer dresses and accessories to women. Um, prior to that, I was an IC for a long time, an individual contributor. Um, I worked on a lot of big distributed systems and actually I got involved in open source uh, back in around, you know, 2010-ish, 2009 kind of time frame. Uh, and I am still a committer and PMC member for the Apache Zookeeper project, although I will admit that I should probably give away those uh, those bits uh, because I, uh, you know, I uh, haven't been doing a lot of contribution lately, given all the other responsibilities in my work. But I'm very passionate about open source. I was on the founding technical oversight committee for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, I, you know, oversee a lot of open source work at my current company. Um, I am hugely passionate about, you know, open source is just a critical part of the tech ecosystem. And, you know, I think the Apache Foundation is one of the, one of the greatest out there. Um, I also, of course, am a manager and leader, and I actually wrote a book uh, on, on management. And uh, no, this book is actually not on 
uh, specifically on applying engineering management and leadership to open source, but it is still probably relevant to, to some people on that. Um, and I wrote this book because I was in between my time as the CTO or the runway and joining Two Sigma. Um, so I took about a year and a half off to do various different things. Uh, and one of them was writing a book. And I wrote a book because learning how to grow from you know, an individual contributor or someone who knew a lot about software um, and knew kind of how to run projects, but had never really led a team to becoming a manager was really, really hard. I had to learn a lot. Um, I had to grow in a lot of ways. Um, what I found was that building a team is one of the hardest things you can do. Um, and I think building a community is also one of the hardest things you can do. Um, this is a picture of me with my going away gift from, uh, from Rent the Runway. Um, my nickname at Rent the Runway uh, was uh, The Hammer. Um, and so this is a very large fitness hammer that has the, the phrase Sisu on it, which uh, maybe means something like with the help of perseverance, one manages through impossible challenges, maybe. Um, but you know, I got the nickname The Hammer because I came in uh, to this leadership role at Red the Runway. And I thought that the way that you lead people is you're really technical and you know what to do and you tell them what to do and you come down hard on them when they do the wrong thing. Um, and as you can probably imagine, that didn't go so well. Uh, so I had to pull myself out of that hole of, uh, of leadership in order to really make my team successful. So I learned a lot of things in the process. Um, a lot of things that I think apply not only to building successful teams at companies, but to building successful communities and projects. Um, and so I'm gonna share with you a few ideas on what we think engineers want, right? What do I think they want? I think they want rewards. I think they want you know, to see the value of their contribution. I think they want respect. Uh, I think they want you know, to you know, get some stickiness of commitment. And finally, I think they, they seek purpose, right? They wanna have a feeling of ownership. And yes, you will notice these, uh, this terminology does in fact follow, follow the Apache terminology a little bit, right? You start as a contributor, you become a committer, and then maybe someday you become a project owner overseer, right? So let's dive in. Rewards, contribution. What gets people in the door of a project? What gets people to contribute in the first place? Well, look, let's be honest with ourselves. Economics is a big part of it, right? Uh, Rich just mentioned that he uh, has a day job. He works for Red Hat, right? A lot of us get involved in projects because we need to do them for our day jobs. That's how I got involved in Apache Zookeeper. I was building a big system that relied on Zookeeper. There were some problems that, uh, you know, some bugs that I needed you know, get fixed so I could do my job. Uh, so I got involved and that's how I became a contributor, right? I had an economic incentive, which was doing a good job at the job that I'm getting paid to do. Um, for other projects, people get involved, maybe because not because they need it, you know, for their current job, but because they want to get a new job that uses this cool new technology, right? Um, we sometimes have this kind of, you know, no true Scotsman idea in tech that in open source that like, oh, only people who are just genuinely intellectually interested in a project can valuably contribute. But look, the truth is that a lot of us work on open source and contributed open source because we think we're going to get something out of it, right? In the same way that we choose our jobs because, you know, at least partly, we think we're going to get paid well, right? Um, of course, there's more to it than that, right? Um, you know, one of the uh, things that gets people contributing and keeps them contributing is that they feel like they're actually able to do so productively without too much pain. Um, I want to remind all of you uh, who are you know, active uh, you know, contributors or committers or owners of projects, remember back to the very first time you had a patch accepted and how good it felt. I remember it was like super exciting. It's just, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm an, I'm an Apache contributor now. That's great. Um, and even more, remember how exciting it was when the change that actually had your patch in it actually went out and now your name is on the contributor list, right? Um, those feelings are great, right? People love to feel like they have not only done something, but they've actually done something that has now shown value to the world. It, it feels amazing 
when that happens. Um, unfortunately, it can be really hard to get that feeling um, in projects for various reasons. When I was at uh, Run the Runway, one of the best early things that I did to kind of improve the team and, and, and help everybody just you know, be more engaged at work was that we had gotten ourselves into this situation where we kind of over-engineered part of our, of our website. Um, and that meant that it was really, really hard to uh, ship features. So anytime you wanted to do a release, it was like a ton of manual work. It was very error prone. Um, we just kind of made a mess. And so I supported the team in saying, okay, like we're gonna take some time and fix this, put in some automation, simplify some of this design and make it so that we can release much more easily. Um, and actually push them to say, okay, we need to be able to release once a day. Now, those of you who are in the you know continuous uh, delivery world or whatever may think, eh, once a day, who cares? But look, once a day is way better than once every two weeks or once a month uh, with days and days of work to, to get something ready, right? So this was a big improvement. So we did the work, um, team turned it on, and it was amazing how much this improved the engagement and motivation of the engineering team. This simple change of making it easy for people to get changes out the door uh, was a massive morale boost to everyone on the team. I recently uh, had this situation happen again um, and, and did this turnaround with the team again. And I will never forget that, you know, before we did the turnaround, one of the engineers described the team as feeling constipated. Uh, I, I bet all of you have had that experience with your price. It was just everything's a little stopped up. You can't really get stuff out, right? You can't get things done. And it's not like the most miserable situation you've ever been in your career but it's not fun, right? You miss that hit of feeling like you're able to ship, you're able to get things done, you're able to learn. Now, I realize that you know, open source projects are never gonna be able to ship so frequently because look, you've got users like me, I consume a lot of open source projects and it would be really annoying if we had to like re-ingest and verify and all of that you know, open source projects every single day. But anything that we can do to make it easier for people to get those contributions in, in the most painless way possible, anywhere we can reevaluate, where have we added unnecessary bureaucracy or overhead to our project, uh, I think is valuable for us to look at, right? Um, because sometimes, you know, that bureaucracy may have been necessary a number of years ago, but now there is improvements in automation that we can apply to a problem to make things go faster. And people want to be able to get things done, right? If you are a manager, one of the best things that you can do for your team is make it so that they get to say yes to the question, do I get to do what I do best every day, right? People wanna do what they do best every day for engineers that is ship, for engineers that is write code and get things done. So that's all good, right? Um, but once you've gotten people contributing, some of them you want to actually move forward a little bit more engagement into that commitment bit. And what gets us committed? Uh, I think that one of the biggest things about that leads to commitment is actually like a feeling of respect and, and sort of deeper community engagement with a project. So there's this very uh, uh, popular concept in engineering management these days called psychological safety or safety, right? What does that mean? It means that when you feel safe in a group, you feel like you're able to make mistakes. You feel like you're able to ask questions, stupid questions sometimes. You feel like you're able to be vulnerable in front of the team and that people aren't going to mock you or think you're stupid or disrespect you for you know, occasionally screwing up or, or saying something dumb, right? Um, now, this is actually a really important thing for successful teams. You do not have to take my word for it. Um, this actually came out of a bunch of research that Google did uh, a few years ago. And look, it's Google. So they have all these teams. They love to do research, which is awesome. Um, they did this research where they were like, all right, well, what makes our some teams perform better than others? And remember, this is Google. All of these people, you know, have been highly vetted. They do, you know, they have a very intense interview process, right? Um, they are all well paid. They're all working on pretty interesting stuff, right? They've got all of their basic needs met. And yet some teams do better than others what differentiates those teams? 
Well, one of the baseline things that differentiates those teams is that the best teams have that sense of psychological safety. So how do you get this psychological safety thing happening? Um, I think a lot of it comes from a sense of relatedness, right? Where when you feel friendly with people, right? When you feel kind of a kinship, a community, a sense of friendliness with people, um, you know, that relatedness uh, helps to create this psychological safety. Um, and, you know, this is, this is often in startups and in the past and teams. People get this by kind of just having teams that are all fairly homogenous, right? Um, if you look at big companies or tech companies or startups, you see that, you know, in their early days, they hire, you know, people who all went to the same kind of school or who all worked for the same prior companies. In worst cases, people who all kind of look alike, right? People who have strong cultural things in common that helps them sort of shortcut this community building, right? Well, we all, you know, we all know the same jokes about that professor from sophomore year because we all went to MIT together or whatever, right? Um, unfortunately, this is not a great approach if you want diversity on your team. It just doesn't work very well. Um, and more than that, if you look at the world of open source, uh, we cannot rely on everybody having the same background, right? This is supposed to be an open contribution process. And in fact, what GitHub has seen when they've done a bunch of research on how open source is changing, right? They do some great research and publish it every year. One of the biggest things they've noticed is the massive global growth in contribution to open source, right? So maybe in the past, a lot of us could get a buy with, well, most of the people working on these projects are from North America or from the UK or from Europe. That is not no longer the case, right? We have massive contributions from all over the world, from you know India and China and everywhere, which is awesome, right? This is great, but this means that creating these strong communities that are sort of friendly and and have good working relationships takes more work. Now, as a leader, uh, I, even with people who I saw every day in person, I had to do a lot of work to improve my relatedness skills. Um, and one of the things that I had to kind of remember and remind myself of is that empathy is a learnable skill. Um, so this image is from a kid's show here in the United States called Daniel Tiger. So if you've heard of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, it's kind of from that, that creative branch, right? Um, and kids' shows, so I have two, two young kids. Um, kids' shows, you know, a lot of what they focus on is teaching kids how to feel other, how to see that other people are humans, right? Uh, oh yes, like that person is hurt when you do this thing, or this is how you share. This is how you respect that there are other people in this world with their own feelings, their own desires, their own needs, and how you show that you care about them and how you you know sort of develop functional relationships with them, right? This is a learnable skill. This is something that we can all work on, that you can be better at or worse at, but it is not something that you're just born with, and therefore, if you weren't born with it, you don't know how to do it. I am not uh, the most empathetic person in the world, right? It is not actually um, a natural skill for me. I tend to be very much down to business. Let's think about problems. Let's talk about problems. Let's analyze things. And one of the things that I had to learn in creating better teams in the workplace was how to slow down and ask people a little bit about themselves. Ask them about, you know, their marathons or their dogs, right? You don't have to pry deeply into people's social lives, but taking the time to get to know people as people a little bit um, and taking the time to remember that they are people is so important. I have to admit that, you know, as an open source contributor, I have not always done a very good job of creating psychologically safe communities in the past, right? I had that, you know, sharp elbows, strong opinions, um, judgmental engineer thing. Um, and I had to learn how to move past that, to appreciate people's contributions in different ways. Um, and, and to realize that I'm gonna get better results out of a team or out of a community if I'm more welcoming um, and, and able to appreciate the different perspectives that people are bringing to the table. To go one step further, uh, if we want to build successful open source communities, it's not just about engineers anymore, right? Um, you know, the most successful open source projects 
need huge teams of people with all kinds of different skills. Uh, I love the, you know, the t-shirt for this conference. I'm not wearing it, but you know, look, you need people who can draw cool things to make cool, you know, logos or t-shirts for your conferences. You need people who are good at writing so that you have great documentation because God knows one of the hardest parts of getting started with a new project is figuring out how to use it. And often the documentation is just not where it needs to be. You need people that are going to get up on stage at conferences like this and evangelize the project and get people involved and excited about, you know, working on it, right? It is important for us if we want to build effective teams and communities to go beyond just the skills of an engineer uh, to appreciate all of the skills that we need in order to make our teams, companies, or communities successful. Okay, so we've gotten people even more engaged. So now how do we get them to sort of that, that ownership stage, that feeling of ownership? And my experience is uh, that we really need a sense of purpose. We need to develop a sense of purpose. How do, how do you do that? What does that really mean? All right, so like a lot of management, literature and leadership literature is all about the why, right? How are you explaining the why to people? Why does this company exist? Why does this project exist? Why does this team exist? Um, we don't always do a great job of that in open source projects, actually. It's, it's interesting, you know, my experience is that open source projects that have grown organically out of something that someone built inside of a company because they had a need, the why there tends to be a lot clearer. You sort of understand, oh, they built this because they really had this problem. And then they saw that other people might also have this problem and so sort of generalized. Um, but it certainly uh, works well uh, for open source projects, right? A little bit better than sometimes I think people, you know, think there should be a need filled with open source and try to build an open source project around it. Those projects may or may not work as well because the why, their founding why is not always as clear. Um, but as a leader, right, you want to know why a project exists. You want to be able to kind of explain it. But more than that, you want to help people understand the point of what they're doing right now. Um, and this is a piece of work that you can never do enough of as a manager um, and that we often don't do enough of even in the open source community. Right. So if you want to get owners. First of all, look, there's lots of things that can happen with your project, right? There's lots of bugs that could be fixed. There's lots of features that could be added. We all have to make decisions about where to spend time. And a lot of people, a lot of contributors and committers want to do what's most important for the project, but they don't necessarily have the clear idea of what that is. When you as a leader spend the time helping to explain why you would prioritize fixing one bug over the other, why would you why you would prioritize building out certain kinds of features or not building other kinds of features? You are starting to explain to people the values and judgments um, and conditions that you use for making decisions. When you explain to people what the point of what they're doing right now is, they can start to understand how those decisions are actually made, like what's really foundationally important in a very tangible way, right? It's much easier to understand than having just some set of values written on the wall or written on a, a readme for a project. Of course, here's what happens next. Once people start to understand the why of what they're doing right now, and they're really engaged, and they're really into your project, and they're showing the kind of ownership that you wanna see, right? Where they're fixing bugs without being told to, and they're going the extra mile for the community. They're gonna want to understand how we decide where we're going next. And they're gonna to wanna to become part of that process. And oftentimes leaders fall down here. We want people to you know, go the extra mile and get things done and you know, you know, show the users that like this project is like really going places, but we don't actually want them to let, we don't actually want to let them make decisions by themselves. Or we don't actually want to really give them uh, you know, that ownership. And that is a problem that causes our projects to struggle, right? You cannot scale if you are not willing to give away your Legos. So there's a great blog post by a woman named Molly Graham called Giving Away Your Legos. You can Google it. Um, and it's about leadership in startups, but I think it applies very well to any kind of leadership. You know, as you're building something, right, you're building a cool Lego structure with your friends, right? Um, if you want to build something really big, really fast, you can't dictate where every single brick goes. You can't hoard all of the Legos yourselves. You have to share them with the people around you 
so that they can contribute their own piece of the structure. When I was at Rent the Runway, one of the best things that we did for really taking engagement of the team to the next level was that the executive team worked very hard to think about what the high level business goals should be. Where should we be focusing our time from a strategic sense? And what were some of the metrics that really made sense there? But then we gave those goals to cross-functional teams um, and said, all right, guys, tell us what we should build to get there, right? You now have this sort of high level direction, but we can't tell you every single project that should be built to get this team to the next level. We can't scale it. An executive team can't be telling everybody every single little thing they need to do. Um, that just doesn't work, right? Uh, and so we gave them you know, the high level vision and the high level goals. They actually came up with what the work would be to achieve those goals. And that led them to feel significantly more ownership and purpose over the outcomes than they would have felt if we had just told them exactly what to do, right? And this is the goal. You want people to not only feel ownership over the outcomes, you, want, you need to give them some incentive and some actual you know, autonomy into how they're going to achieve those outcomes if that's what you want to see. All right, so all these different things, right? They have interacting effects. It does, it's not like a ladder, right? It's not just that like, oh, somebody you know, sees some reward from something, so they kind of get, get involved a little bit, and then they like the community, so they get involved a little bit more, and then they feel like they really have some ownership over the project, so now they're at their highest level of commitment, and you don't really need to worry about the other things, right? I have seen plenty of people who were very committed leave projects because it was just too hard to get things done. It was just too bureaucratic. It just, the cycle time was too long, and they had too many other things going on in their lives. I think that's very common, and sometimes that's the right thing, but sometimes that's a loss, right? I've seen people who felt significant ownership and had done amazing things for projects uh, leave because they felt that the community was not a safe and welcoming place for them. Um, and that is always a sad thing to see, right? And when, when somebody who has really given a lot um, you know, to a community feels you know, bullied and ostracized, that can be, you know, that's, that's not a place that I think any of us wants our open source communities to go to, right? Obviously, this is all very fraught in the modern world, but you know, making welcoming communities is so important, um, even for owners, right? Even even owners, even people that feel a huge amount of you know purpose and community ownership need that. All right, so to summarize, the five the three factors of engagement are rewards, economic rewards, status, right? Working on a cool open source project is a nice thing. Employers love that. Uh, but more than that, people think like to get things done so that they can learn and grow and just feel accomplishment. Engineers like to ship. Never, ever forget that. Uh, respect, safety and relatedness and community and partnership that goes beyond just people that are exactly like you. You know, never forget that those people that you're communicating with via email or Slack or pull request, those are humans, right? And if it's worth it to slow down and choose your words carefully and be kind if you want to create uh, a healthy and engaged community. And finally, of course, purpose, right? Why, why does this thing exist at all? Why am I working on this thing? And now how do I become part of the decision-making process, right? You've gotta give away your Legos, owners. You've gotta be willing to let people make decisions that may not be exactly the decision that you would make. So, as I said, in the time of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future, and tech is all about change, right? This is what, you know, a five megabyte hard drive looked like in 1956. It's kind of, kind of crazy to think, right? We're three generations out from this photo, and things have changed, and they just keep changing and keep changing and keep changing. And so it's up to all of us to stay open-minded and keep learning and keep questioning was this approach that worked five years ago, is this still the right approach for this project, for this foundation, for this community? And of course, one way to keep learning is to read. You can read my book. Uh, the Manager's Path is, my, is, is my, my main book on all the stages of engineering management. I also wrote a book, I also edited a book called 97 Things Every Engineering Manager Should Know. For those of you who are engineering managers, you might enjoy that. Uh, if you would like to talk to me, you can try tweeting at me. 
Um, I occasionally write on my blog. And uh, you can try emailing me, Camille at Apache.org. I will admit that I do not always uh, answer email well. So it's a little bit of a roll of the dice. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for having me. I'm super honored to be here. And I hope you all enjoyed this talk and have a great rest of your day. I was reflecting while you spoke, one of the things that's so great about today as compared to all those years ago is when we were just kind of making stuff up as we went along. And now there's all this expertise and research around this topic. So it's, it's really great to hear from you. And thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation. Thank you for having me.